Okay. Yes, I'll call that. Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the Chilean Pavilion. Thank you so much for being here on Oceans Day at Blue Cup 25. Um, my name is Jesse Turner and I'm the program manager for an organization called the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification. Uh, and we bring together governments, national and subnational governments around commitments uh, to, to better understand and then to address local impacts of ocean acidification and other stressors um, under changing ocean conditions. Um, so this event is a really uh, special event that brings together a lot of our ocean partners, both national and subnational. Uh, and we will begin with some opening remarks uh, from the California Chile Council, which really highlights that collaboration between subnational and national on this particular topic and through the alliance. And then we will welcome keynote remarks from Secretary Wade Crowfoot with the California Natural Resources Agency um, to, to kick us off before moving a little bit into the science. Uh, and then into some of the regional actions taking place around the world in Latin America, in the Pacific, in Africa. And then close with um, a couple remarks from the OA Alliance and how we are moving from science to action. And then hopefully, um, if, you, if you all can uh, stay, we'll have final remarks from Minister Cuve, uh, who is the Chilean Minister of Science. So thank you. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, my good friend and colleague, Matias Acalde, with the Chile California Council. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you for all your brilliant work. I really have enjoyed working with you. You're really a great energy and moving things forward. Um, the Chile California Council is a nonprofit foundation established in San Francisco, it has the 501c3 status. Uh, so it's a neutral organization from its origin for transforming and facilitating public private action. Um, it has counselors, uh, all game changers, and it has the support from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Therefore, it's a great organization to facilitate and move forward transformational processes um, from the areas of focus that the Chile California Council uh, is now uh, focusing. So um, those areas today and, and now in COP uh, are energy, how we lower and transition into a more cleaner um, uh, matrix, uh, how we improve soils while we do agriculture and, and manage better the water, and how we look into conservation strategies both in, between Chile and California, and in this specific moment how we can learn from California's action uh, at the coastline. Chile and California are trans-hemispheric twins. Uh, they both share a long mountain range that drains into a fer fertile valleys that end into the Pacific Ocean. They're both uh, long, but they're not narrow, they're wide, because great part of their territory is oceans. Uh, it's not only land. Therefore, um, if you think about Chile 60 years ago, uh, yes, it's under m way more underdeveloped in population and human settlements and land use, definitely. But uh, I've come to understand that we're also far behind in matureness in, in how we deal public private issues, how we get together to solve uh, many of the challenging problems that are affecting us in, through society that we need to work them together. For, for me, it has been wonderful to see the California experience and how uh, you've been able to move forward um, great science policy-based uh, regulations, but always from social movements that have initiated great things that have great outcomes at the end. So ocean for protection for, for California and Chile, which are coastal... Um, by excellence, you know, coast, coastal spaces by excellence. It's a very important um, matter. And when you think about ocean protection driven to the coastline, it's even more complex because it really uh, requires to get a lot of people together, to get uh, different stakeholders and different people seeing and bringing consensus to the table. Therefore, um, today we have an opportunity for oceans underprotected. We have a great social impact when we think about the coastlines. The coastline will be the, more, the most affected due to climate change effects, sea level rise, uh, climate effects, effects with storms uh, and great floods, will increase immigration, will increase uh, different uh, population and infrastructure damages. So focusing on the coast makes sense. And exporting great policy from California, which I'm very, very honored that 
to be working for and, and to be thinking that this type of policy could be exported elsewhere. If we think on starting to acquire that, those type of approaches into social uh, action uh, involving climate, involving nature, involving environment, I think uh, we have a long haul and a long relation to keep building from great experiences. I really want to thank the opportunity uh, to set this vision uh, in this place, like COP25, where I think it's uh, multilateral relations make you think a little bigger than when we're used to. Uh, so why not uh, maybe keep building this relation, exporting these this great ideas, this public policy for our coastlines, uh, which has basically all the ingredients to move uh, ahead in the agenda and think about connecting efforts from north to south in the coastal Pacific Ocean. Thank you so much, Jesse, and I leave you to Mr. Wade Crawford, Secretary of Natural Resources Agency of California. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, I want to just thank our colleagues from Chile, um, not only for this event, but really as we experience this whole event, um, we need to acknowledge their leadership and their resilience. We use the word resilience a lot. Let's give them a, let's give them a round of applause. Um, we use the word resilience a lot in the climate space, and I have to acknowledge uh, uh, Chile's resilience over recent months. Um, taking literally years to plan the meeting that we're now at, uh, and then uh, quickly uh, navigating the change of venue um, while maintaining its leadership uh, as the president uh, for this year. So uh, huge thanks uh, to you. Um, also thanks to Chile for elevating uh, oceans as a critical priority. If you think about this conference of parties, um, we have all come together across the world to address a common resource, and that is the atmosphere. But for too long, we've ignored another common resource, which is our world's oceans. Literally, if you think about this, literally the, our oceans touch each of our continents across the world. They are really the resource, in addition to the air we breathe in our atmosphere, the resource that binds us. Fully 71% of the world's uh, surface is covered in oceans. So for us to talk about the health and the future of our planet without having oceans centrally focused is, um, is an omission. And I think thanks to the presidency of Chile, uh, we are now elevating um, this COP obviously as a blue COP uh, to really focus on the oceans. So this hopefully is the beginning of a much broader elevated conversation on oceans. And as, as we all know, whatever country uh, or state or province we come from, um, oceans are important. They're important economically. Uh, globally, the uh, uh, OECD suggests that our uh, blue economy, our oceans-based economy, will grow to a $3 trillion economy across the world. So it's important from um, a global economic perspective. But perhaps more importantly, it's, it's critically important for countries um, next, to, next to our oceans. Um, much of the protein um, that many people in the world actually consume to live uh, is actually derived from the ocean. So we need our oceans economically. Uh, I'll also say, obviously, that they're very important to us culturally. So in California, you think about the, the sort of the, our iconic beaches, our Golden Gate Bridge. Much of our own identity in the state of California is tied with the ocean. And you could say that for countries and states and provinces around the world. And then lastly, obviously the ocean is critically important to our environment. Uh, healthy oceans are going to lead to a healthy planet. Unhealthy oceans represent our, an imbalance that will essentially result in an unhealthy planet. So critically important uh, for so many reasons. I'll share a little bit about what we've done in California and how it relates uh, to the discussion uh, here today. Um, and it's really recognizing that our oceans are in crisis. I think we all understand that our oceans have literally been absorbing the problem that we come to Madrid to talk about for decades. Um, and they ha the, our oceans have actually um, taken in that carbon dioxide um, that has reduced the, the, the impacts uh, to our atmosphere, but obviously created major impacts in, in our oceans, including uh, acidification. Um, obviously, we're dealing with sea level rise as well. Uh, for some uh, countries who come here, that is literally an existential crisis that threatens their very existence. 
even in a place like California, where we have a lot of land um, that will, would, will not be underwater, we have huge challenges from sea level rise. Um, science suggests we may lose over half of our beaches um, in the next 50 years as a result of sea level rise. And if you've ever been to Southern California, you understand the economic importance of, of those beaches. Um, so I think first is we, we, we obviously recognize the, the, the challenge. I'll, I'll highlight three areas of, of focus in California to, just to build context for the discussion here today. The first one is on ocean acidification. So um, I would say five, ten years ago, we acknowledged this challenge of ocean, ocean acidification and really looked to the leadership of the state of Washington uh, to the north. That is actually was, was more advanced in California on recognizing this problem. And so initially, uh, the, the first area of focus was getting our hands around this, understanding how, what is actually happening uh, on our coasts and our oceans as it relates to acidification. Uh, and so we worked with our partners in Washington and Oregon um, through a network called the Pacific Coast Collaborative, um, which includes those three states and British Columbia, to really get a baseline understanding of the problem of ocean acidification. We'll talk more about that um, uh, to here today. Um, so that, that coalition actually was, um, was an important first step to a much broader coalition, recognizing that no one province or state or country is going to actually solve ocean acidification. It's one of these uh, tragedy of the commons. Um, so that initial effort to understand uh, ocean acidification in our region with our, our partners to the north has uh, grown into a broad global uh, coalition that we'll talk about. The second area is actually protecting our ocean life uh, in uh, and around California. We're very proud that um, we are one of the first places in the world to create a network of marine protected areas. Um, these are, in essence, um, underwater uh, preserves. Um, that uh, dot California's coast, I believe 124 of them uh, total. Uh, and they are designed to essentially be uh, natural uh, refuges uh, for sea life. We think that's critically important to maintain our biodiversity uh, and our nature in the oceans. Um, and I should say, um, improve our blue economy because we know thriving fisheries are really important. And what we don't want to do is deplete those fisheries um, over time. And so these marine protected areas are, are actually critically helpful. I'll say that in developing that network, um, there was a very careful process um, that was followed to include uh, stakeholders that would be impacted by these marine uh, protected areas. Um, that includes uh, indigenous tribes in California uh, who have uh, rights uh, to harvest bounty from the sea and are critical to the success of these areas. It also includes, obviously, our fishing industry. Um, many communities on the California coast uh, depend on, on our fishing industry, like many places in the world. So as we built this network of, of protected areas, we had to do so very sensitive to the needs of our fishing communities. So this was a careful process based on science to establish these, these networks. We used science as the foundation, and then we were informed by a lot of interaction with parties that know the ocean and would be impacted by these policies. We're almost 10 years into this effort to protect um, these, these places, and we are finding that they are, have been very successful uh, in maintaining the biodiversity, the life in the ocean, and they've had benefits outside of their protected areas. One of my hopes, and I think a hope of, of Mateus, and why we share this uh, image on the screen is, it's a big goal, but could we create a network of marine protected areas across the Americas? And could we, could we continue to create more marine protected areas in other parts of the world um, where there's tremendous um, biodiversity uh, and importance of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the blue economy but that, haven't, that don't yet have this, these marine protected areas. Um, so we're excited to talk about that. And then the third area is sea level rise. Obviously this impacts different places differently. Uh, in California, uh, we put out science guidance to all of our local communities and our state. And what we suggested is that given the acceleration of sea level rise, that 
uh, communities should plan for up to three to five feet of sea level rise in coming years. And now we're grappling with what that means uh, at, uh, for our state investments and our communities that are along the coast. Uh, so more on that to come. Um, very excited to be here. Uh, I think this is an area where California w has learned a lot from other states and, uh, and also other countries. I think we, among the coalition of the willing here, if you're at this event, you care about oceans, I think one thing I'll, I'll close on is the need to continue to elevate this. So as we go into the uh, COP next year in Scotland, how can we build on this blue COP to continue to elevate this issue? So it is a central discussion in all of the pavilions, in all of the negotiations uh, moving forward. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Secretary and Matias. We so appreciate the leadership that the California Chile Council has shown. Obviously, the state of California, a co-founder of the OA Alliance. Uh, so thank you for being here today. Uh, so with that, we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive now into the science around this report that we're all hearing about here at COP, the special report on ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. Um, and we, I'm very happy that we're here with two amazing people um, to give us a little bit more of a deep dive, both around some of the impacts to loss of oxygen occurring because of climate-related changes in our oceans, uh, and then more about acidification that will root us uh, maybe as we go into some of the regional work. Uh, so with that, I'm delighted to turn it over to Dr. Lisa Levin with Scripps Institute of Oceanography, who's also a uh, contributing author to Chapter 5 of the special report. And uh, we are running a little bit on time, so I will start to give little time signals as we go, if that's okay. Okay. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you about oxygen. Well, I'm not happy about oxygen loss in the ocean, but I am happy I get a chance to talk about it. And this is something that's really important to both Chile and California. And I just came uh, from a nine o'clock press release of this document called Ocean Deoxygenation, Everybody's Problem. A big report put out by IUCN, which anybody interested in this should, uh, I have the link at the end. But, but my job today is to talk about uh, what the SROC, the Special Report on Oceans and Cryosphere, tells us about ocean deoxygenation. So what is it? It's basically the loss of oxygen in the ocean. And this report focuses on this loss in the open ocean. So ocean deoxygenation results from ocean warming, which reduces the solubility of oxygen in seawater, you can see a temperature oxygen plot right there. A big relationship, warmer water holds less oxygen. Warming also increases oxygen consumption and respiration rates, and it increases the density layering, the stratification of the ocean, so oxygen is less well mixed vertically into the interior of the ocean. Deoxygenation can also be exacerbated by the addition of excess nutrients in the coastal zone. So we have coastal eutrophication. That was not the focus of this report, but warming exacerbates eutrophication. Why do we care? Oxygen is essential. You're all breathing it out there, right? So does most of the rest of the life in the ocean. It basically is important to every other structural, functional part of marine life and, and is necessary for the ecosystem services we rely on in the ocean. I'm not going to run through all of these because of time. The other thing that as our ocean warms, it's important to know that it, animals require more oxygen the warmer it gets. So you can see the changes in saturation that happen with warming, but the least I'm trying to see if I, I don't think I have a pointer here, and I can't walk away from this. Oh, it's fine. The lethal, lethality of oxygen rises with temperature. So an animal that might have been happy living at 50% oxygen saturation in cooler water, as it warms, that could become lethal to them. That's important because it means all the animals in the ocean now are needing more oxygen than they did as the ocean warms. Where's oxygen in the special report? It's mentioned in the summary for policymakers and in the framing chapter, but where you really find it is in chapter five, the chapter I worked on. It's mentioned 127 times, oxygen loss or oxygen, ocean deoxygenation. 
And basically, this report acknowledges the complex nature of oxygen, that it's controlled by a balance between production. Phytoplankton, photosynthesis, produces oxygen. Um, and it's respired by organisms, but there's also a lot of vertical mixing that goes on. Um, and the biggest changes in oxygen that are happening now are in the upper 1,000 meters. Um, this is a really important plot. It's in the summary for policymakers. It tells us that oxygen has been declining over the last 50 years. That's the purple based on real observations. And then there are projections into the future based on different emission scenarios. And this tells us we have a big choice. Look at the difference between RCP 2.6, curbing emissions and limiting warming versus, and, and oxygen actually goes up into the future. So some of that loss is replaced versus RCP 8.5, business as usual, continued loss of oxygen to, and this is in the upper 100 to 600 meters. So we have pretty good data on what's gone on in the past. It's not perfect, but all the areas you see in red on this map have lost oxygen, especially we see loss in the equatorial Pacific, the North Pacific, the Southern Ocean, and the South Atlantic. But on average, the ocean has lost 2% of its oxygen in the last 50 years. But this does not tell you the real story because some areas, and they're highlighted here, have lost 20 or 30 or 40% of their oxygen, such as the outer shelf off California. So there are real big changes happening in some places, and oxygen loss is a, a regional process, it's some, or it's highly variable regionally. This is from the special report, one of their many complex figures that show confidence levels for changes in all the major ocean parameters as a function of region. And the main thing I want to draw your attention to is that oxygen has the lowest confidence level. And this is because we have the sparsest data on changes and because oxygen is also very highly variable. So it's hard to distinguish natural variability from climate-induced change. Um, we do know, and the special report talks about this, that oxygen minimum zones have expanded. These areas you see in blue, the volume is um, increased by three to eight percent. And we know from studying modern oxygen minimum zones that this is going to lead to a loss of biodiversity, um, alter the distributions of both seafloor and water column species. It's going to reduce the body size of animals, their ability to bioturbate and sequester carbon. It's going to alter food webs. It might even affect our chemosynthetic ecosystems like hydrothermal vents and methane seeps. Oxid ocean oxygen Ocean oxygen deoxygenation is effectively habitat loss. Um, we know that species that can move away from low oxygen will, especially fish and crustaceans, and we see massive fish kills in areas where animals can't leave. And this has occurred both in, in the open ocean, but, also, but uh, I should say we see this mostly in the coastal zone, but open ocean animals experience habitat compression as oxygen minimum zones expand. They're pushed up into shallower and shallower water. The tuna and the big billfish are experiencing this, and they become uh, very vulnerable to overfishing as they get more crowded in shallow waters. We know that ocean oxygen deoxygenation is putting estuaries at risk, and we've seen a huge increase in our coastal dead zones. We've we are pretty sure that warming is contributing to this increase. Um, oxygen loss is putting cold water corals and deep water at risk as the oxygen levels decline. It interacts with ocean acidification to create a problem. And really, ocean oxygen loss doesn't occur alone. It's a multi-stressor problem occurring with ocean warming and ocean deoxygenation. And we really need to study how all of that comes together. If we look at projections of future trends in oxygen, we see that oxygen will largely decline by 2100 in all scenarios. 
um, and the volume of OMZs is going to expand by possibly 7% up to 2100, and um, the majority of the ocean is going to be affected. But you can see this RCP 8.5 projection, all the brown areas are oxygen loss, especially the Southern Ocean, the North Pacific, and the North Atlantic. Um, the SROC has projected impacts, and um, the message here is that the tropics will be very hard hit by loss of primary production, which will lead to loss of total animal biomass and loss of fisheries catch potential. We have a lot of challenges in dealing with oxygen. Our models and our observations don't there should be another figure up there. Our models and observations don't actually agree with each other in some cases. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of natural variability. So um, some parts of the ocean, we can uh, see emergence of oxygen signals very soon or now, and other parts we can't. You can see oxygen falls after warming and surface pH in terms of the um, area that will be affected over time. And that is because of the natural variability. I'm down to one minute. So I have to talk about what do we do about this problem. And there are a number of solutions. Our mitigation solutions are to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and reduce our nutrient inputs. We're all about greenhouse gas emissions here. COP needs to be successful to help solve the oxygen problem. And adaptation, we can improve our aquaculture practice, our fisheries practices. Marine protected areas will help create resilience and counter deoxygenation effects. And finally, I just want to say we need to do more observing and monitoring. We have the IOC's Global Ocean Oxygen Network dedicated to raising awareness. A lot of them contributed to writing this big document, and we need to make more oxygen measurements. So the biogeochemical Argo, the next technological advance in Argo, will have oxygen sensors and contributing to helping make uh, oxygen measurements in the global ocean. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Levin. That was, uh, I'm thrilled to have been able to witness that myself. So thank you for being here. Um, so following that, we're going to have um, Mr. Peter Swarzynski, probably Dr. Peter Swarzynski, with the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, and particularly with the Ocean Acidification International Coordinating Center uh, to tell us a little bit more about ocean acidification state of the science and then move into telling us what, why is the IAEA involved in ocean acidification uh, and what does their program currently look like? So thank you, Peter. Great. Thank you very much, Jesse, for organizing this session. Um, good morning, everybody. I work for the International Atomic Energy Agency and today I'm not gonna talk about nuclear safeguarding or nuclear security. I'm gonna talk about international coordination and capacity building on ocean acidification. And Jesse asked me just to spend a little bit of time um, describing some of the results from the SROC report as it relates to pH, oxygen, um, um, ocean acidification. Oops. So Monaco has a, has a very illustrious um, partnership and collaboration with the IEA that dates back more than 55 years on all things related to marine matter. Um, I run a, a lab in Monaco called the Radio Ecology Laboratories where we develop and utilize a suite of radioisotopes to study um, a diverse spectrum of environmental and marine stressors including ocean acidification, deoxygenation, <clears throat> pollution, marine plastics, and harmful algal blooms. As a testament to this, to this very strong relationship between Monaco and the ocean, just a, a month and a half ago, Monaco hosted, as many of you know, the release of the SROC report. <clears throat> and now the next couple of slides are going to, I'm going to quickly present some of the summaries. As we know, we need the ocean intimately for our sustainability. Um, many of these points have been covered, but I, I just wanted to highlight a few of them. As we know, it plays a very important role in climate regulation, in weather, and in the global carbon cycle. It carries 50% of global productivity and ocean production. It's very important for um, biodiversity, and it provides very important social and economic goods and services such as tourism and transport and fisheries, obviously. In terms of some of the observations, I want to preface this by the IPCC chair's opening statement saying that 
the greenhouse gas emissions must start to peak next year. So we have a huge, a very tall order on this. In terms of observations, carbon emissions from human activities are causing ocean warming, ocean acidification, and oxygen loss, as we just heard from Lisa. More than 90% of the open ocean surface pH has now been in decline. The open ocean is losing oxygen. Ocean warming is contributed to observed changes in biogeography. This has very important implications for fisheries and ecosystem change. <clears throat> so Lisa showed an, an excerpt of this slide, and I thought I would just highlight, um, because I have a very short time to go over it, I wanted to highlight ocean pH. And I, I pulled out uh, the green, the yellow, and the, the pink squares on this. And as you notice, um, while oxygen has a very low confidence, for pH, we have a high confidence, and it is in decline in all the water bodies of our oceans. <clears throat> the pink um, shows negative effects, and if you go just look at the last um, group of, yeah, the, the last um, section, you can see there's, there's an overwhelming amount of pink as it relates to human and ecosystem services. All right, so now quickly towards the projections. All climate models are going to predict that we're going to have tremendous significant changes um, in the ocean over the next century. By 2100, the ocean is very likely to warm by three to um, six degrees, depending on which RCP um, we choose to adapt to. It's virtually certain. <clears throat> it's virtually certain that the surface ocean pH will decline consistently, and then the upper ocean will continue to stratify. And as Lisa showed, the oxygen is projected to decline much further. And the um, expected coastal ecosystems then will respond over the 21st century in terms of habitat contraction, migration, and loss of biodiversity. And as Lisa showed for oxygen, I have excerpted the, the pH um, projected scenarios under the different RCP um, scenarios. All right, so the next part of my talk is now going to move towards what the IEA is doing to, to primarily build capacity on ocean acidification. And it's amazing um, that ocean acidification is still a relatively young discipline. If you look at this plot of number of papers over time, just since the last 15 years, there's been this big surge in the number of papers. And the member states asked the IEA to respond to this increased interest in ocean acidification. And as a result of that, from the, the 2012 Rio Plus 20 conference, the IEA launched the, international, um, the Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. I'm going to jump through this. The only thing I wanted to mention here, it's obviously that there are some hot spots where publications are coming out on OA. But just as importantly, it identifies where there may be some renewed investments need to be done on, on building capacity in ocean acidification. <clears throat> so here are the three pillars of the OAICC. We do communication, we build capacity, and we engage in science activities. And our target on audience is everything from policymakers to scientists to educators to students. And we have a portfolio of tools that we try and utilize and develop to, to build capacity. And this can be um, expert missions, it can be trainings, mentoring, online resources such as bibliographic databases, best practice guides, and as a, as a housekeeping note, the IEA, um, the OAICC is considered a peaceful uses initiative project um, in that we can bring in um, reimbursable funds from many member states and we're very lucky up till now we've gotten a um, considerable amount of money from more than 12 countries around the world. And um, the work of the OICC is certainly done in, in, in very strong and productive partnerships with many, many of our um, collaborators and, and friends. And I'm not going to go into each one of these, but there are everything from, from um, universities to governments to multi-government agencies. I wanted to give a one slide overhead of the Go On, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, the OICC has played a large role or an important role in, in, in advocating and implementing the, the, the Go On. And I, the previous map showed um, the number of publications per region. This, this shows 
the OAICC sponsor trainings and networking opportunities. Um, <clears throat> and it shows that there's been strong, vigorous investments in Latin America and the Caribbean, in Africa, as well as in Southeast Asia. And, and specifically since 2012, so roughly the same time, um, there's been almost 700 capacity building opportunities involving more than 500 scientists in close to 70 countries. Uh, another tool or vehicle that the IEA has to build capacity is a coordinated research program or project and we, the Radio Ecology Labs, just initiated a new CRP on looking at the, the global impacts of ocean acidification on seafood. And this is involving more than 17 member states. Um, one of the nice things about a CRP is that there's a direct partnership between developing member states and developed member states. So there's this nice collaboration um, to build capacity. And one of the, the things that we're trying to accomplish with this CRP is that we have a standardized methodology around the globe to look at the, the impacts on, of OA on seafood. As a UN entity, you can imagine we're, we're very engaged in the SGD process and the OACC plays an important role in two aspects as it relates to uh, SGD 14.3 um, on ocean acidification. And the first one is on the reporting process and we work closely with IOC UNESCO as well as go on members to develop methodologies and data management tools, reporting mechanisms um, to advance ocean acidification. And then we also are involved in the community of ocean action on OA where we have been coordinating webinars um, to increase coordination and networking. And um, with that, I'm going to end, and I'm, I just have this slide of the first OA training in Cape Town from 2015. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Peter and Lisa, for, um, for that overview. That is a great introduction now to moving into our next panel that's going to be specifically focusing on what Peter introduced as the Global Ocean uh, Observing. Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, or GOON, uh, which is increasingly moving towards developing regional hubs to advance the science around ocean acidification, as well as communications trainings. Um, and we're gonna hear a little bit more about that. We'll have three panelists join Bronte after the first presentation, so giving you two the option of staying put or if you wanna come back down here, that's fine too. Um, so Bronte will just provide a quick overview and then we'll invite our next three panelists. Thanks. Um, I'm involved in the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. I'm a co-chair. I'm uh, a biogeochemist based in Tasmania. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've, there's a lot of logos on this. They're all groups that contribute. Goons uh, made up, the success of Goons really by the interaction with its members, through the interaction with its members. So um, if I can, yeah. Um, you know, we've, we heard a really good summary from Peter about what's in the SROC report for ocean acidification. It is one of those uh, things that we're very, uh, changes we're very certain that is happening in the ocean because uh, it's so closely tied to CO2 emissions and CO2 increases in the atmosphere, more so than any other stressor. Um, and ocean acidification has the potential to affect marine organisms and e ecosystems in many ways. Some are listed here. Uh, this is from the Ocean Foundation, one of our partners. And in response to the concerns about ocean acidification, the Global Ocean Observing Network was set up in 2012. Uh, it's an integrated network to detect ocean acidification and, and uh, the ecosystem responses at uh, local through global scale. So a lot of the information we have is on the big scale changes, but there are many uh, more extreme changes occurring in coastal waters that impact communities. And uh, there needs to be a lot of uh, extra work done in there in that region, which the coastal areas, which I'll come to. Uh, I just wanted to point out this is just a shot from the website about some of the activities that are going on. So, uh, Go On is uh, really a central place to get information for researchers. And I just wanted to point out here Latin America is doing a lot, and Chile in particular. And uh, just the red circles just indicate some of the new data that's coming in from Chile. Uh, some pre-cop meeting with seafood producers uh, and there's another uh, a huge symposium planned for September 2020 in Peru. So 
Um, Latin, Latin America is really one of the leaders in this effort. Uh, as I said, Go On started in 2012. It had, uh, I remember it, the, the original, the slides that we see on the website are perhaps a little bit deceptive. I was in the room, there, were about, there was about this many people. It's now grown to over 700 members from 98 countries. It's, 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 it's growing every day. New people are signing up. And you can see the aims. Uh, not only do we to look at what's changing in the ocean, the conditions and the ecosystem response, but it's really about delivering data products that are going to be useful for researchers and uh, policy makers. And also for building capacity in uh, making these measurements and outreach, as Peter has, has mentioned. Um, one of the activities I think Golan's really been, uh, should be proud of, is one of its successes is uh, assistance with capacity building. Uh, Peter mentioned there's been over 500 participants from 69 countries involved in this. That's really fantastic. I don't think there's much that compares. Uh, Golan's role is to provide, its members uh, provide expertise to help in the training. And another key part of the work is um, Golan members uh, have set up a mentorship program where there's a connection between people, early career researchers involved in the work uh, in, in these training exercises can link to experts and they maintain those links for a number of years and it helps them with things like writing proposals, uh, visits to labs and it's the connection between uh, developing countries and other countries that have been involved in this work for, for much longer and it's, I think it's a real benefit to the uh, developing country and early career researchers that uh, are involved in the mentorship program. Uh, there's also work done on, uh, through, particularly through the Ocean Foundation on delivery of uh, equipment, basic equipment to some of the uh, people involved in the uh, training workshops and there's a picture on the left showing that uh, and uh, I mean many of the pictures on the bottom are involved, uh, show the, uh, some of the equipment. It's fairly basic equipment but allows countries to establish monitoring uh, and this has uh, been really beneficial to see uh, not only, you can go to these training exercises and then you just go back to your own country and there's not much there and you, you have a, a hard time getting the equipment. So this is really facilitating uh, not only the, the training but actually implementing monitoring in many countries. Uh, Peter also mentioned the work with Sustainable Development Goals. goan has been uh, very closely involved in setting up uh, SDG 14.3 reporting mechanisms and uh, quality control and um, uh, that's, and, and Goan's also a connection point where we can get members to start to contribute to voluntary commitments to the SDG process. So, and that's been very useful. We're starting to see a lot more of them in ocean acidification. Uh, one of the last points I want to mention is that a really important component of uh, Go On are the regional hubs that we've uh, set up. And uh, we're going to hear talks about three regional hubs, mostly from the Southern Hemisphere, which I think is great. Um, uh, OA Africa, La Oka, and PI uh, Toa, which is Pacific Islands, stands for Pacific Island Territory and Territories Ocean Acidification. Uh, they all have different uh, needs to a large degree. Like Pacific Islands is more focused on issues for coral reefs. Uh, La Oka has been doing a lot of work on seafood production and interactions with agriculture, among other things. And OA Africa is uh, one of those, is a region where uh, there hasn't been a lot of uh, monitoring work started. And it was just starting now, so it's starting to build. And there's been a lot of effort, as Peter mentioned, in capacity building in uh, Africa. Uh, these have been, the, the, these hubs are really important because they have direct input into the go-on planning. It's not just some big international group telling everyone what to do. It's these in, individual regions having input on what they think is important and go-on responds to that to make sure that they're priorities in our work. And it also links, it, it brings together local expertise and knowledge and that's helping to build collaborations across countries in the regions. So it's been very successful. So uh, in the next few minutes, we're going to hear some uh, three talks on the uh, regional hubs. Firstly, uh, 
Uh, Martin Hernandez Leon, from, uh, who's uh, one of the leaders of La OCA. He's from the uh, Autonomous University of Baja, California, in Mexico. So, Martin, you. Thank you, Bronte. I, I think the presentation already set. And uh, I was thinking in the, your dream that you was talking about, and uh, I live in the Pacific side, and I'm very familiar with the Lisa topic about the oxygen, and we used to have this uh, seasonal moving of the, of the oxygen minimum zone in these transitional areas, and also the pH from the Washington, and then these two phases of the environment is uh, kind of clear for me to be living at the same time, right? And, and I was also about talk, uh, thinking about your dream about the, the net, the network. And uh, it's quite close, eh? because you can see that GON is set, and also the LAOCA is set also. And uh, let me tell you about uh, our, our conditions. Uh, in 2013, uh, we have a meeting in Washington, and uh, you can see in white area the, the, the gaps that we have, the low information that we have had have for uh, Latin America. And uh, we sat with uh, some partners from Chile and Argentina and Colombia, Brazil, and we were thinking, why we don't uh, integrate and work together? And uh, this is how La Oca grew up in, in, in Concepcion. La Oca was set in, in Chile in December 2015. We started with uh, some guys, uh, uh, shares from Brazil, and uh, Christian Vargas, and also Nelson Lagos from Chile, was working as a co-chair, and go on IOCCP members. And we was keeping working, and uh, now we, we feel very comfortable with the progress that we have. At least we are working more in the observations. We are working in some modeling, um, experimental evaluation. I think uh, in, in Latin America, I can tell you that uh, the Chilean guys are working a lot on that. There are people from Brazil, for example, that they have a very good progress in the carbonate uh, chemistry system. But in reality, we are working a lot in different, in, in, in different targets. For example, um, this is coming from the plan of the regional action plan, it was just published in this year. And all the gaps we have are set on this four target. We are working on that. We are working on the quantified changes. We try to understand consequences in the ecosystem and society. We want to learn how to communicate the information because we want to arm the policy maker and to go to the high levels uh, government decision to work together with them. But in reality, all these four targets are different for each country. It's different for some places like Belize, they, they just started from zero. Uh, Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras. We need to involve different countries to be working together. And we want, of course, with the umbrella of Goa on, with the partners of IOCCP, to offer instrumentation and to work together to teach and to be working as a network. And uh, I guess this is an, uh, uh, a communication. Uh, we're going to be part of the hard work, uh, high CO2 work symposium. We'll be in Lima. Uh, La Oca is working a lot on that. And then we want to share it to book in your calendar. And we, everybody is invited to be with us. And thank you. Thank you, uh, Martin. And next we have, um, we have Dr. Nayira Sheltout from the Ocean, uh, OA Africa, Ocean Acidification Network in Africa, to tell us a little bit about that hub's work. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk to, uh, to represent Ocean Acidification Africa Network to this um, great community. Uh, thanks for Ocean Foundation and for OA Islands. Um, I'll give you a short brief about Ocean, Foundation, uh, Ocean Acidification in African Hub activities. 
for at the beginning, uh, the network vision was to ensure that African is knowledgeable, resilient, and knowledgeable to all the impacts of ocean acidification, uh, threats to the coastal area of Africa, and how it impacts the socioeconomic impacts on African continent. <clears throat> The network, uh, it's a network of scientists working together to provide information and guidance to stakeholders and policymakers. In addition, it uh, aims to coordinate an activities between uh, regional and interregional inter cooperation between African countries. And the final, our, the final vision is to identify the broad support for OA research and monitoring activities. The network goals is to help to coordinate and, uh, and set original priorities for monitoring and research design to further our uh, understanding of coastal acidification. The second is to identify the gaps in understanding of scientific and socioeconomic of ocean and coastal acidification impacts in Africa. The third is communicate and facilitate the exchange of knowledge to relevant stakeholders and funding agency and respond to stakeholders' needs and uh, questions. Increase the scientific capacity to monitor and predict the OA impacts, and finally, to ensure the quality of data uh, generation that representing the situation of ocean acidification in coastal areas of Africa. As you know all, it's a different uh, LMZ, and each set, its area it has its unique properties and resources. The growing of OEA Africa, as you see from a presentation of Pronti and my colleagues, that at the beginning, uh, under the umbrella of Goa on, as the beginning of um, the hubs, only one country from Egypt, uh, from Africa, joined the uh, network for all. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, this is the vision. <laughs> and I'll not repeat the goals again. And this is the growing of the community. Uh, you can notice, anyone can notice the difference and how growing the community since 2012 from one country in uh, South Africa to uh, eight countries joining in 2017, and uh, happy we are now 18 countries in 2019. And <clears throat> under the umbrella of Go On, the main activities is capacity building activities uh, recognized in training for basic chemistry, basic uh, biology, advanced training. The second is providing kits and deployment of sensors. The third is funding for projects and mentoring and mentee programs. And uh, generously, this is the um, funding agency who support these uh, capacity building activities in, in uh, Africa. Uh, IEA, OA, IECC, Go On, on Future Earth, Wyomsa, Solas, Emper, uh, IUC, UNESCO, and the, uh, the Ocean Foundation. Uh, giving a short <clears throat> view for uh, the capacity building trainings and meetings in OEA Africa. That's Cape Town. The starting was Cape Town, November 2015, and 25 researchers uh, trained in this uh, training, followed by two basic trainings, one for chemistry and biology in Mozambique and second in Mauritius in, in July 2016. And I want to investigate one point. When uh, IEA uh, decided to set an experiment and uh, capacity building training in Mozambique, they went, the trainers and the professors went to Mozambique, and they only have an empty lab with nothing, even no electrical plugs. 
and they started from the scratch. They constructed the lab for five days using their portable equipment for pH and portable spectrophotometer, and they did uh, great work for um, training for a basic biology and chemistry for monitoring of ocean acidification and biological response for ETN researchers. This was followed by a training for basic chemistry, basic carbonate measurements, and basic biological measurements, uh, I, um, identification and monitoring in Mauritius in 2017, in 2016 for 20 person. This was followed by the first in-person meeting for the network in Senegal and a side workshop for the training of 21 person. Then they moved for uh, capacity building for the West African countries because after doing a survey, they, um, the community realized that for the Western African, they have nothing, they haven't lab, they haven't any experiment, any data. So they started to focus on West African countries. And they organized a training workshop in Ghana for 17 young researcher and master students. This is followed by a workshop in Mauritius, and this is for the deployment of the kit, providing the kit and deployment of ISAMI sensor. Following and moving to a more advanced uh, training from the basic training to more advanced one for setting an experimental biological experiment uh, training and setting the impact to how to study for three weeks trainings and this three weeks experiment to um, study the impact of ocean acidification and to learn how these, to learn these young researchers how to set up ocean acidification experiment. And this is followed by many trainings for the uh, training in Sweden. It was four researchers, and this is followed by another many numbers of, of trainings. <clears throat> As a sum up, 80 person, 80 researcher, young researcher from Africa participated in trainings. For the workshops and the conferences, they funded 42 researchers. For peer to peer program, 51 person participated. For the peer to peer program, uh, 45 mentees from 15 countries were joined together, and four projects, four peer-to-peer -peer scholarship awarded to mentees from South Africa, two from Cote d'Ivoire and Nigeria. And you can easily, you can easily recognize, I'm sorry, you can easily recognize that the area of the circle that's in green, that's the capacity building program provided to African countries. And um, these different colors or shading colors of green, it's uh, representing each country. <clears throat> and now, one of the most promising activities that we did, we, although we have nothing. For OE Africa, we decided in uh, 2017 to celebrate Ocean World Ocean Day and in our own way. So we decided to do a measurement of ocean uh, pH and along the whole coast of Africa at the same day, whatever you, the equipment you have, whatever the facilities, if you have a ship, if you have a boat, if you have an equipment, if you don't have anything, just go to the coast and bring samples and measure pH and do that. And from the pictures, it's some randomly selected uh, photos, you can distinguish the variability between each country and the other. Okay, and with the support of, o of IEA, um, they did a great job. Then they gathered, they collected all the major data, the major data in one map, and presented, put a report and presented in newspaper. Uh, make a video for television, uh, then publish it in social media, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, for all the fields that raise the voice for Africa, how it's impacted, and how the African countries are keen to work together and to study the impact of ocean acidification. And this one of the steps that's building steps and take away Africa for a um, step forward. This is an example of what Goa on provided by the general support of Ocean Foundation. That's the um, kit providing for kits given six scientists through the Africa program. Went to uh, different countries, to six countries. Uh, two of them are uh, deployed in um, Mauritius as a Goa on kit. 
and in this way they combine the basic trainings with the equipment. And then these countries or these scientists started to measure, to measure and have their own data. Uh, for the next two years, pH and, GP at the, and the measurements of situation, stations identified. This is the deployment and this is the station for collection the data. Okay, I'll go through this. This is uh, Wayumsa, the initiation of Wayumsa. Uh, Wayumsa is Western Indian Ocean Marine Science uh, Association. And uh, during the workshop organized by IUC UNESCO and Future Earth, Nairobi Convention Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, IAA, they organized, they initiated WAYUMSA, and um, they started to support ocean acidification research in uh, East Africa. They organized the training and workshops, different workshops, and support, give supports for the African countries in the East, in the East Africa. Uh, and they actively participated to encourage the production of white paper for East Africa and oh, uh, for East Africa. Um, and then they funded six projects for the East African countries, one for Kenya, Mozambique, Mauritius, and Sicily and Tanzania. They funded these projects for the um, monitoring and um, monitoring and of the ocean acidification. Then they launching of they support the launching of white paper for East Africa and the other activities is supporting or launching the white paper for West and North African countries to communicate researchers in Africa and bridging global OA research and data, data, data gaps and identifying the data gaps, build potential partnership to attract interest and attention of an institution, develop an action plan, and identify priorities and gaps in knowledge. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Naira. And we'll have one last speaker before talking a little bit more about uh, closing with a video from the OA Alliance and uh, remarks from Minister Couvet. But uh, right now we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Duncan McIntosh with PITOA in the Pacific to give a brief overview of the work in the Pacific. And we might be able to do a one minute rapid question um, if Bronte feels like that's appropriate for each, for each speaker. Thanks, Jesse. Um, thanks, Jesse, for organizing this event today. Um, thank you very much to the IAEA, Peter, and uh, to the Ocean Foundation for the travel support. So my name is Duncan McIntosh. Uh, I need the clicker. Thank you. I'm the Oceanography Officer at SPREP, the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environment Program. If you're not familiar with SPREP, we are an intergovernmental organization headquartered in Apia, Samoa. And our members include 21 Pacific Island countries and territories. We also have five metropolitan members. But these are not small island states. We're big ocean states. So we cover a lot of area when it comes to being a regional hub of Goa on. Some background about a project that um, I manage for SPREP, and keep in mind this is just one of the activities underway for the Pacific Islands Regional Hub of Goa on, but it's the one that I, I can tell you the most about. We have many active scientists that are members of PI TOA that are doing great work around the region, but this project became uh, an idea that was started at the third UN SIDS conference held in Apia Samoa in 2014. Discussions there identified the need in the Pacific Islands region to monitor OA, to build capacity and resilience against OA, and to implement adaptation strategies in our region. So we formed a partnership uh, between SPREP, the University of the South Pacific, and uh, SPC with financial support from the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and from the government of the Principality of Monaco. This way. Uh, the project was designed with four focal areas. Uh, that include research and monitoring, capacity building, policy support, and adaptation actions, which are uh, specifically located in three pilot sites. So one in Fiji, one in Kiribati, and three in Tokelau. For the research focal area, we have published a regional OA vulnerability assessment that's available on SPREP's website. 
We've published, uh, in collaboration with SPC, a vulnerability assessment of pelagic fisheries. We have established a Pacific Islander PhD scholarship fully funded at the University of Newcastle, and we're very pleased to announce that we now have a student from Papua New Guinea who is researching coral restoration and coral resilience to ocean acidification at our pilot sites. For the awareness uh, focal area, we have published posters in Pacific Island languages, including Kiribati, Fijian, Samoan, Tokelauan, Cook Islands, Maori, and others. We have English versions um, here today. This is a low paper cop, uh, a paper light cop, so um, only take one if you have a real use for it, but we're really happy if you can use the English version of this poster for your OA outreach activities. We have them in the back there. For the monitoring focal area, um, this is where uh, we, we really have gotten great support from Goa on, from the Ocean Foundation, and from the IAEA uh, in training and providing equipment for this um, monitoring. And so through a partnership with the Ocean Foundation, we've been able to provide these Goa on in a box kits. They include an ISAMI spectrophotometer. It's a great little instrument, won the X Prize a few years ago. Uh, we provide um, titration equipment you see there to take water samples and measure the total alkalinity. And so this allows uh, Pacific Island nations now to participate in um, reporting to the SDG indicator 14.3.1, which is reporting pH. We've also established a partnership with the Korean Institute of Ocean Science and Technology to provide a little fancier OA monitoring equipment. This is in the form of MAPCO2 buoys. And um, we have already installed MAPCO2 buoys in Palau in uh, Federated States of Micronesia at Chuk. One is on a ship on its way to Samoa right now as we speak. So these uh, record a little more precise um, climate quality data than the handheld ISAMIs do. And then in the adaptation sphere, um, we have held multiple rounds of stakeholder consultations so that the adaptation that takes place in the stakeholders' communities is driven by the stakeholders' own priorities. So what we do when we hold these com consultations is first raise awareness and education of what OA is and why it's a problem, and then we go over some of the uh, adaptation options that communities may want to take. So one option that communities can take um, is enhancing primary production. So you can either support mangroves, seagrass, other aquatic vegetation that can sequester some carbon through photosynthesis, and this can have a local buffering effect on calcifiers that may be nearby, like coral reefs. Coral restoration to enhance reef resilience, you can focus on increasing coral ground cover, coral biodiversity, or target specifically resilient species of coral. Reducing reef stressors, as we've heard, uh, OA is just one of the uh, stress multipliers that our ecosystems are, are facing. So by better managing the whole ecosystem, we can reduce the overall stress and give the, the coral ecosystem a better chance to be more resilient against OA. So some of the management techniques that um, modern practices call rotational closures, permanent closures, uh, locally managed marine areas and MPAs, some of these techniques have been used in our region in the Pacific Islands for millennia. So they're not new concepts and as a matter of fact they have um, names that uh, people are very familiar with. A rotational closure is a tambu tara in Fiji, a permanent closure is a tambu and an LMMA is a fa'asau, o lingatai fale, in Samoa. So these are well received in the Pacific Islands, and um, local communities and um, village chiefs take ownership and, and do a great job of managing these when we introduce some uh, monitoring and science that they can take and, and run with. Another adaptation option that reduces pressure on the reef is reducing the fishing pressure for some reef dependent communities that depend on their coral reefs for food security. Uh, we project some of the productivity to go down for a number of reasons, OA is one of them. So you can take pressure off of the reef, give it a better chance to recover and, and be resilient and at the same time provide food security by say for example supporting aquaculture as an alternative livelihood for reef dependent communities. In Tavayuni, one of our pilot sites, those stakeholder determined priorities turned out to be focus on mangrove restoration, LMMA development, 
and developing alternative livelihood opportunities. And for this, we've partnered with the Fiji LMMA Association, with uh, Conservation International in Fiji, and with the Wakatu Foundation that does really good educational outreach in Fiji. In Tokelau, um, being the maybe the smallest um, Pacific Island nation, we're able to work in the entire country. So we have pilot sites in all three atolls there, and their priority was very heavily on coral restoration. So I just returned from Tokelau last week. Um, some of my team is still there, and we're doing the baseline surveys where we're going to go back early next year and start the coral planting. And in Kiribati, the priority was seagrass restoration and developing a, a comprehensive locally managed marine area. And this is cited at Nanikai Village in Tarawa Atoll. And finally, on policy support, uh, we have published uh, this handbook for Pacific Islands that um, gives practical examples uh, of how to mainstream ocean acidification into national policies. We have some hard copies. Uh, available in the back or on the table, and then this is, of course, downloadable on SPREP's website. So I just want to reiterate that the work I, I shared here today is um, work that I'm doing at SPREP, uh, but we're part of a larger network, the Pacific Islands uh, and Territories OA Observing Network, that's received a lot of support from GOA on, from the IAEA, and we have great um, scientists working with us in almost all of the countries that I showed on our Pacific Islands map. Katie Sawapi is doing great work. Antoine, we have uh, Warren in Papua New Guinea. We have a big team, and so I just want to make sure that um, I'm not stealing the spotlight, and I wish some of them could have been here, but with the change of venue, it, it was challenging. So, Next steps for us is that we're hoping to seek additional support, because as I mentioned, we're only working right now the adaptation actions in three pilot sites, and we've gotten a lot of interest from our other SPREP member countries to uh, can we have adaptation actions in our sites? So, like everybody, we are reliant on, on our donors and we're actively seeking more engagement. So, please come talk to us if you have abilities there. So, with that, I say muchas gracias to Chile and thank you very much. Fafitai Lava. Thank you, Duncan. Um, and with that, I think we are not going to uh, have time for questions for the panelists, but find them um, after the event. So next steps, we're going to have a quick video introducing the OA Alliance. Uh, we'll hear five minutes from Governor Inslee's senior ocean advisor, Jennifer Hennessy, talking about what the OA Alliance is and how it's uh, mobilizing some of the science work into policy action, very much along the lines of what Duncan just described. Um, and then Minister Cuvet is here with us, and he'll provide concluding remarks. And we will end on time. So thank you all for being here so much. We appreciate it. And with that, we'll go ahead and play a quick video. When we emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, up to 30% of it is in fact absorbed by the ocean. This causes ocean acidification, which affects marine ecosystems and species by making it more difficult for calcifying organisms to form shells and skeletons. The big impact that we've seen so far is with our oyster seed and the ability to produce oyster seed. The changing ocean chemistry, they're unable to build their shells. We're the largest producer of farm shellfish in the country in Washington state, so having no seed for our farms had a lot of implications for thousands of jobs on the West Coast. In September 2019, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published a special report on oceans and the cryosphere. The report explains that the rate of ocean warming has more than doubled since 1993, and the pH of surface waters, an indicator of acidity, has dropped by up to 30%. The science in the most recent report from the IPCC is alarming, uh, but it can't be paralyzing. The special report is especially important because the sea level rise, the melting of glaciers, are now substantiated by the best science available. It will allow governments to move forward in adaptation, mitigation, and bold steps that need to be taken. Modeling and forecasting like the IPCC report helps us do that, as do our state and federal partners in the state of Washington, help us more locally understand what's happening. Over the last decade, the ocean science community has studied the potential impacts of ocean acidification 
and real threats have already been observed. As a result, the International Alliance to Combat Acidification was formed, bringing together governments and organizations working on similar challenges and committed to taking actions. There is only one salvation to the oceans problem. We have partnerships with the Ocean Acidification Alliance and what they've been doing on uh, developing frameworks for ocean acidification policy. Countries can look at what's out there, what's already been achieved, what they can build on to achieve best practices across the Commonwealth. We all know the oceans in crisis, and we also know that no country or state or province uh, can solve it by themselves. We need to identify leaders across the world that are committed to taking actions necessary in their jurisdictions to contribute to solving the crisis. We need to work together. That means that those shores that have not yet had the thunder of OA reach them like it has already reached our shores. We want them to join with us and lock arms so that they can be prepared when it does reach a neighborhood near them, which it will. All right, that's a great transition for me. Uh, and Wade, uh, so aptly said it in the video, uh, the reason the West Coast of uh, North America- When we emit car- Oh, it starts again. <laughs> uh, launched the, the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification in 2016 is because that we can't do it alone. As we began to address this issue as it was affecting our shellfish growers and others, we knew we needed to partner uh, with others. Uh, the Ocean Acidification Alliance serves an important role in facilitating greater knowledge and transitioning it to policy action by subnational and national governments and others. It is ensuring that the ocean is incorporated into our climate change policies and is integrated into achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It is also helping elevate ambition and urgency for climate action. We are calling on, through the OA Alliance, uh, governments to take action in five key areas. One is advancing scientific understanding. The second is reducing the causes of ocean acidification and changing ocean conditions. Greenhouse gas emissions need to be reduced urgently. We also need to work on other exacerbating sources like nutrients. Third is building adaptation capacity and resilience. Fourth is expanding public awareness. And fifth is building sustained international support for addressing ocean acidification. Currently, we have over 80 members and 40 are governments. And by next week, we're hoping to have 15 national governments on board. We are on track to meet our goals of having 20 action plans by our members developed by June of 2020. On Washington State, you've heard a little bit about uh, our early firsthand experience with ocean acidification led us to become a leader on this issue. And we are really, we're really pleased to have Chile be an early member of the OA Alliance. More recently, Washington State and Chile partnered on a technical exchange regarding ocean acidification. Representatives from Washington's shellfish growing community, our science community, and government participated in a series of pre-COP events uh, across Chile. This allowed us to learn more about the scientific activities already going on on the ground and the growing concerns about impacts to mussel farming and artisanal fisheries. And there's a, a range of experts growing, doing scientific monitoring and research in Chile. And we were able to ex exchange our experience with ocean acidification and the actions that we've taken to transition our knowledge into action. And uh, we participated in an event in Santiago hosted by Chile's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, with both the Minister of Science uh, as well as the COP25 Ambassador Olson. And we're very pleased to have uh, Minister Cuve join us here today to make some closing remarks. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I feel like, a, like, like saying to be here again. Um, dear friends of the ocean, 
Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, the hosts of this side event and congrat congratulating them on their success. Uh, the Scripps, the Chile California Council, uh, the Ocean Acidification International Coordinating Center, uh, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, the OA Alliance, the Ocean Foundation, and Universidad Santo Tomas. Uh, as a Chilean science minister, I applaud all the wonderful initiatives that have been presented today. Um, I think during this week, we've seen many things about the ocean. We had the chance to receive, uh, once again, the report of the IPCC on oceans and cryosphere. And, and I think my message is always the same. Uh, we've seen that the report uh, describes changes, changes that are worrying. And then it goes to a second section where it describes the projected changes, and they are even more worrying. So one sees that one type of response is that of fear, of paralysis, of an apocalyptic vision, catastrophic visions of the future. And we think that as a Ministry of Science, we should promote a responsible, urgent, but responsible view, um, a view of opportunities. Uh, and many of these opportunities will come from science, from technology, and from innovation. And of course, from the collaborative effort of networks. So I think by seeing who's here today, I think you give the same importance to networks and collaborations. Uh, and also, from the hand-in-hand -hand work of scientists and policymakers. And this, I think, it's the same that, uh, that the IPCC reminds us. And the IPCC also reminds us that governments may better achieve their social, economic, and environmental goals by promoting science and a broad range of technologies through mission-driven innovation policy. So opportunities, science and technology, innovation done collaboratively, national, international, private, public, um, cross generations. Um, we just had a meeting with uh, a group of young people that have been gathering here at the COP, more than 800 of them. Uh, they produced a report, uh, and they produced a report which they will uh, hand to us with, in addition, the things that they can do that nobody else can. So I think it's really important that we assemble in different ways to collaborate. Um, this has been the, the Blue Cop, and we put science at the center of the discussions. Uh, we've launched the platform for ocean-based solutions. We've discussed the IPCC report in depth in more than one occasion. We've continued our long-term planning with our partners, such as the organizations that are here today, such as Monaco, the UK, aiming to include the oceans as the central aspects of discussions of actions in the future. So we, we are building a roadmap to include the oceans in, in all the actions related to climate change. Uh, and at this meeting, uh, in which we have learned about the importance of collaboration, again, monitoring acidification and the urgent need for action, uh, being true to time for action, which is the call of this COP, of the Blue COP. Uh, in Chile, we invited the oceanographic community who provided a report with recommendations. Uh, the summary uh, for policymakers was generated and presented here at the same stage a few days ago. And the recommendations include the creation of an integrated monitoring system, uh, which we are helping to develop from the Ministry of Science. They, they suggested that we need to have more information, especially in, in, in the South Pacific, uh, and we need an integrated monitoring system built from sensors, integrated capacity, data science, uh, and availability of that data for research and for innovation if we're talking about um, opportunities. Uh, our NDC, uh, which will be delivered in March 2020, includes the ocean as an integrated pillar of mitigation and adaptation. So we look forward to build on these initiatives, to inspire and be inspired by others. Um, and there can be no doubt, science must be at the center of climate action discussion, efforts and actions. And I think this has been 
our role at this COP is to put science at the center of the discussions. Uh, so I welcome the efforts and strategies presented here today, and I encourage you to continue your work in the same constructive spirit. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Minister. It's been so fantastic. Uh, Chile was actually one of the first national member of the OA Alliance when we launched back in 2016 at the Our Ocean Conference, so thank you. Uh, and with that, we are a wrap today. Thank you all so much for being here and providing remarks. It's great to see you all on Ocean Day, and I look forward to seeing more friendly faces as we go through the day's events. Um, oh, and I'm being told that a photo would be a good idea. So if you spoke, um, and if the minister can hang around, that would be fantastic. Thank you.